We can be the solution to the, the, the broader basins issues. The river is alive. It is a person. And we have to treat it that way. Look, we can contribute to you. You should see us as a benefit, not as an enemy. Ten tribes have a different way to govern their people. We're all different, we're all unique. But the water is a common ground for us. We're stronger as a collective than as we are by ourselves. Even if one person isn't as strong as the rest, together we're strong, we stand strong. We are, we're not going anywhere, we're united. And the tribal water study really was created in, in, to uh, create an, an, an awareness and an understanding of tribal water rights in the Colorado River Basin. When our reservation was established, that was the promise made by the United States government when they wanted to us to be farmers, that we would have water. Over the years, the reservation has grown from what was originally identified in that treaty, and that treaty was signed in 1868. In the treaty, they agreed that the Navajo Nation would be able to thrive on, those words aren't in the treaty, but that's the way I interpret the treaty, is that the Navajo people would be able to live on the reservation according to their life ways and thrive on the reservation. We have not settled all of our Indian water rights. Imagine it's like a cup of water, right? You have the states and everybody else already drinking their fair share of the cup of water and there's a little excess, which is the Indian water right. They're all fighting over that. So you've still got to get the, the cup divided, right? Because you've got the Indian water right and you have the state water right. Until you get them kind of defined, they're always going to have a conflict that exists. Here on the Fort Yuma Indian Reservation, uh, you know, this irrigation system that was developed one of the first irrigation projects on the Colorado River over 100 years ago. We're left with an irrigation delivery infrastructure that is wearing past its design life. My hopes for the future is that the endangered ecosystem continue to be on the front lines in order to restore the river to its original state, or at least as close to it as possible and also that the federal government exercise its trust responsibility to protect reserve water rights that relate to the Colorado River. It's both, in my opinion, a legal and moral obligation that the United States has to Indian tribes. Today, when I think of the trust responsibility, I think it is very much about the United States supporting tribes to define their own um, existence, to support tribal uh, tribal definitions of life on the reservation. They play a role, they have a strong trust responsibility to assure that adequate funding or that uh, adequate service is being provided by their contractors. Um, all that requires vigilance. The snowpacks in the mountains are no longer as, as much as it used to be back in the old days you could always realize that you would have three feet of snow or more 
on your land. Now it sometimes it's a dry winter. You know, you hardly have any snow. You know, you get maybe a foot of snow, and then that's because of the climate change. You know, you just it's unpredictable now what you, what you're going to look at for next year. The broader study estimates by 2060 the imbalance will be 3 million acre feet. And it's no, it, for us, it's no surprise that, you know, the tribes, the total amount of, of their water rights is close to 3 million acre feet. And we know that at some point in time that that, that, that water will be a target. And, and so what, do we, what is it that we do to circumvent that? You know, we become active participants and active partners in the solution. And by having equal access to those development opportunities, the tribes can actually, you know, be the solution for the basin to a large degree. Hey, all the excess water left in the Colorado River are tribal waters. And uh, we don't get that fifth column about tribal waters. Our waters are incorporated in each state's uh, uh, identification of water. And I think that's why we, uh, you know, we started the project about to discuss and put the brand on Native American water in the Colorado River. every drop that we have because of the fact that, you know, funding is very limited. So that limits development on the reservation itself. We, as a Ute Mountain Ute tribe, have never been able to use all the water that we have. But that doesn't mean that in the future that we're not going to become more innovative in, in, in trying to, to use all of that water. Those that plan on and base a lot of their growth on the excess water that's going on downriver, Pretty soon, that's not going to take place. There is going to be no excess water from tribes because we are working harder than ever in order to make sure and to ensure that we protect our own selves by utilizing every drop of water that we possibly can. It's going to be used for what it was originally intended for on the reservation. The Tribal Waters Study studies different development growth scenarios. There's uh, slow growth, static growth, and uh, fast growth. We're developing our economy at a real fast pace and we got to have that water uh, being brought from the river to the nation, both throughout the whole nation, uh, for economic development, for ranching, for farming, all of those. Uh, housing developments, that was one of the things in the past we looked at was a, a, a whole uh, development on the southern half of the reservation, basically a, a small town. And along with that would come all the water from domestic use and, and uh, business use and things like that. So I think it's all, it's, for us, it's coupled to development. So expanding agriculture would be one of the big ones if we could achieve that. Every state is growing in terms of population growth. And so whether it's a drought contingency plan or population growth, uh, it, it all matters in terms of water and the use of water. Now, if you go to presentations presently about the drought contingency plan, they never mention population growth. They only mention the drought. So you can have an ease of the drought in the near future and it'll still have impact because the population is growing so large. We are um, wanting to hire um, a water operator for the tribe, because currently we do not have one in place. Um, we did have one before through a grant, and, but right now we um, rely solely on Bard Water District and BOR to account for the water. You know, we do feel that there's some discrepancies, but until we get someone in place to do our own accounting, you know, we're kind of stuck in a situation at this time. Because of the drought situations that we do run into sometimes, it really says, you know, we got to do a lot better with our water efficiencies, and we really stepped that, that part up really well. 
and again, in turn, that goes to our crops, the yields that kind of come off of that. So, I mean, it's really a, it's kind of science in, in, in working. So the value of water is really high once it goes into retail. No one wants to discuss that. And I think that, uh, but everybody within each state knows how much the water is benefiting the state and the non-Indians. Uh, so I think the whole idea with the 10 tribes study was to show that we have a brand too. We need to get that brand out there that it's our water they're using. And the policies that exist, as they exist right now, really prohibit us from marketing our water to the extent that we need to. And so what came out of the study for us is that the, our real opportunity are outside state boundaries. But one of the things that we, that we realize is that our water leaving the state of New Mexico would not significantly, significantly or, 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 or hardly at all impact anybody in the state of New Mexico. Down the river, Colorado River Indian tribes, they have water rights both in Arizona and California. But because of the law of the, the, law of the river, California versus Arizona in the big the lawsuit, if their water in California should become low, they can't take their Arizona, Arizona water and supplement the California side of the reservation because that's taking Arizona, Arizona water and giving it to California. There's a potential for all the agricultural practices upriver and dispelling all the nutrients and nitrates. Uh, that's what I think is more concerning for the future is uh, with more and more farming, uh, there'll be more, um, again, nitrates and possibly selenium in the river water. And uh, that's one of the areas that I, I'm thinking the tribe should have some concern about. The Gold King Mine, the, you know, the contamination that happened up there, it really made us think about, you know, what are our protections if the cities up above us, um, you know, whether it be uh, all the way up the river or closer to our area, what would we do in order to protect our, our lands and understanding what that quality is going to be like when it actually gets to our reservations. I went with medicine people up, uh, up, to, the, up to, the, um, to the mouth where the, uh, where the contamination started and we did the long prayers with the, the, the chanting, the singing and we blessed the river so the, so the river could come back to life. And so there's these ceremonies and prayers are connected to uh, to the water being healthy and alive because uh, that's how our medicine people uh, teach us is that the water is it has a life of its own. I always ask for uh, blessings upon you know our use and if we're going to use it now and take away some of that beauty then we offer forgiveness for for taking it in, in the and maybe cutting down a tree for whatever, you know, we always ask for forgiveness or for drilling into the land to develop your oil and gas or whatever, you know. Forgive it, and if we're developing houses and changing the landscape or whatever, forgive us for changing what the way the Creator has put things together, you know. The river in itself has, you know, always been, you know, who we are. It is who we are named after, our name, Ahamaka, that is people of the river. And so we come from that. When it was wild, you know, we used to swim in the river. It was just like our playground. That's all we knew. And so for us, it's, it, it's very important for us to protect that for our future. The river continued all the way across to the other side. There's another mesa area on the other side in Yuma. The river was full of water. So all this, even Yuma was underwater. El Centro was underwater. So all those uh, certain municipalities were underwater, we were underwater. And the tribes occupied the Mesa area, which is, I think we're pretty much on the Mesa area here that got, uh, of course, destroyed at some point, making this canal, All-American Canal. You know, we're always told after the fact, or we're told once it's already been decided upon, it's, you know, people have signed on the dotted line and the tribe was not even consulted with. And I think, you know, with the 10 tribes, that's the one thing that we all stand for, is that, you know, that none of our rights are infringed, and that as a group, as a unit of the 10 tribes, that we support each other. If they so uh, decide from a tribal leadership perspective, they can be part of the solutions that people are looking to and provide more flexibility in the system that will benefit everybody as well as the tribes and its members, too. Right now, states need to 
and the federal government needs to really take a closer look at tribes because they have a certain expertise or a certain knowledge that I think they didn't really value, but I think tribes in the future will have a lot more influence because they have the, the history of the tribe itself and being within these geographies. So I think they'll, they'll play a key role, you know, in the future going forward if they are at the table. If they're not at the table, then they're again, you know, you're just right back in the fight. Thank mm-hmm. you.